Hiya pals, today we are going over an Oris OU team from long-tenured Oris veteran Crash and Boom Bang. Now, most people associate CBB with all-out offense. He spams Bisharp like his life depends on it, and yeah, his most well-known team has a Jellicent, but it also has two Specs users, Mega Metagross and Scarf Landorus. He lives and breathes hyper-aggressive offense. This team is a bit of a departure from that, which I found interesting because it's what CBB considers his best team ever. And it is still offensive, and it still benefits from being played aggressively, but it's a lot more balanced than what he usually brings. It's not a balanced team, per se, but it has a lot of longevity for longer games. It's not playing a screaming pace of kill or be killed every game, and... It has bulk on a lot of Pokemon, so it's a bit of a departure. That's interesting and all, it being so far from CVB's usual style, but that's not why I wanted to showcase this team. I wanted to showcase this team for similar reasons to the other teams I've showcased in this series. A, this team is built well and is a great example of many top-tier strategies in the metagame. B, because the team is innovative and has contributed significantly to the further development of the metagame. And C, because it has seen high-level tournament success, which we will take a look at later. So, let's get into the team. The first thing that stands out about this team is that its choice of Mega is Tyranitar. So in Aorus, it's usually the Metagross show, and sometimes there are others like Alakazam and Diancie and the occasional Metacham and Scizor. But by and large, whatever your Mega is, even if you're messing around with stuff like Altaria and the Charizards, of course, then you're probably not going to use T-Tar. Megatar hasn't been seen since XY, where it was used as a DD sweeper. Not even just XY, pre-Aegislash ban XY. So after that, it just really fell off. So why Mega T-Tar here? Well, it's not so much wa wanting to use Mega Titar as much as looking at the other Pokemon on this team, Gliscor, Rotom, Excadrill, Tornadus, Keldeo, and all of these Pokemon are generally the best at what they do. You're not going to do their jobs better by slapping a Mega over them, and Tyranitar fits well with them, and since you can afford to use a Mega on it, why not? Most of the time, the reason you don't use uh, Mega Stone on T-Tar when you're using a Choice Band Tar or something like that, then it's because you want to be using a different Mega. Like, if you're using a Support Stealth Rock Tar, yeah, it would be nice to go Mega, but you also want to use a Mega Metagross, so you're not going to be doing that. So, uh, here, this team has the luxury of being able to afford Mega Tyranitar and being able to reap the benefits of it because all the other Pokemon are really good, and they do not uh, demand uh, Mega be used in their place for optimal results. So Mega Titar is really, really, really bulky and really, really strong. So it is basically like, on this team, it is a, su a support Titar set on steroids. So it sets up Sand for the Sand Rush Excadrill. And it pursuits the Lottie Twins and Assault Vest Torn Therian and Jellicent for Keldeo. And, of course, gets up rocks and does not invite in defog or rapid spin attempts. So it is all around good support for this team because it facilitates the other members' offensive potential by you know, its whole uh, pursuiting thing and setting up sand for drill. And it also takes a lot of hits for the team, as we are going to see when we get to the games. So that's Megatar. And uh, I have gotten some notes for CBB on the specifics of the sets and whatnot. So we're going to go over that once I've had my say, because otherwise I would just be having him do the video for me, and that's no fun. So, uh, moving on to the Gliscor. This is the innovation of the team, the main one. Uh, so, a lot of the team is not really pushing the metagame forward as much as being an example of the optimal way to run some really strong strategies. And another way to say that is that the core of Rotom and Excadrill and those two alongside Tornadus is 
a, uh, a lot of what Oris is about at this point in time. So it's not really moving that forward. I mean, it is in the little things like the rock slide drill that we'll get to later, but by and large, it's not breaking boundaries. This Gliss score, on the other hand, is very much breaking boundaries. And you're looking at it and you're thinking, why is there no earthquake? And the answer is, Gliscor often really wants Swords Dance and Taunt, just to really mess up stall. Taunt is nice, but you wind up getting switch stalled by stall a lot of the time, especially with all the regenerator flying around. So you really want Swords Dance to make your attacks stick. But with Swords Dance, then you can lose to things like Quagsire, which stalls you out, and Skarmory, and you can't always fit Magnezone. And Swords Dance just has a lot of issues that are fixed by Taunt. But you can't get rid of Roost. Half the point of Specially Defensive Gliscor is that it's this unkillable monster that is just... It uh, has Poison Heal Recovery, which is doubled leftovers, and it doesn't care about status, and it roosts up for uh, a million percent because it heals 62.5, as opposed to a Pokemon with leftovers, which heals 56.25. So it's, uh, it's basically unkillable, so you got to have Roost. So you run Swords Dance, uh, Swords Dance, Taunt, and Roost to really have your way with Stall. And not just necessarily hard Stall, but a lot of the bulky, spiking, balance, or semi-stallish teams that, are, that make up a major part of the Oris landscape. So you do that. And I believe back in the day, then, Jamvad actually ran Swords Dance, Earthquake, Taunt, Roost. And, you know, it was a fun idea, but it lacked consistency. So here, CVV has Facade, and in terms of power, Facade is only 10 base less than Earthquake, because Earthquake is 100, plus Stab is 150. Facade is 70, plus the status boost, uh, doubling it to 140. So power isn't really a big deal. And Facade, of course, is a great move in general on Gliss score because... It's actually stronger than Ice Fang against, uh, what's it called, uh, double effective targets. So like Torn Therian, which is singularly weak to Ice Fang, then Facade does more because Ice Fang is 65 times 2 and Facade is 70 times 2. So uh, you have 130 versus 140, obvious. And Facade also has better coverage, most notably it slams Rotom Wash really hard. So Rotom struggles to keep up with this set, with any facade Gliscor, but uh, this set makes full use of that, because without Earthquake, then Rotom would sit all over you, Torn Therian would sit all over you, it'd be ugly. Other Gliscor would sit all over you, you can't have that. It'd be walled by Lando, well you'd probably stall out Scarf Lando, but the other three are still the big ones. So you gotta have facade, and then you think... Do I really need the coverage of Earthquake, quote-unquote? Uh, so, the answer is, okay, yes, obviously you like having a stab move, and you like having the coverage, but can you live without it? The answer is, surprisingly, yeah, usually. Because, let's look at Earthquake's targets. Things like Titar, Metagross, Heatran, Barathorn, oh, what else is there? Let's look at the Aorus tier list. Oh, like Scizor, that's a big one. Magnezone. And you know, sure, these Pokemon would be a lot more easily dealt with with Earthquake. But for a lot of them, like especially defensive Heatran, you just set up on infinitely. And you, you know, eventually boost a plus six. And you make sure it can't roar you if it even has roar with Taunt. And you beat it down with Facade. Then stuff like Offensive Heatran with HP Ice and uh, Mega Metagross with Ice Punch, then you don't want to be staying in on those. Instead, what you do is you don't really threaten them immediately with Earthquake, but with Rocks Up, which T-Tar is very good at getting and keeping up, uh, then you are able to slowly chip them throughout the game, and they will falter, and Gliscor will stick around like it is so famous for doing. Probably the biggest scenario where you want Earthquake is against... Uh, Bisharp, <laughs> because Bisharp is kind of annoying, but that's why you have your other measures, specifically Keldeo, so uh, you can still to toy with it, but, uh, you know, the moveset, no one would really crucify you for using a more standard Gliscor, but I am of the belief that this set is what makes the team tick, 
And I have tried out this Gliss score myself on several different teams, and I have loved the results. You know, you're still going to handle Excadrill, and the improved matchup against Stahl is wonderful. And not just Stahl, again, defense teams in general, because having both Swords Dance and Taunt gives you an extra dimension to being able to beat Ice Beam Clefable, which is absolutely astonishing, because no longer can it Calm Mind and beat you, it just has to Ice Beam and you can Roost all those and beat it down with Facade, prevent it from healing. It gives you a lot of flexibility to have all three of Swords Dance, Taunt, and Roost. So. Uh, one kind of funny thing is that you actually do end up being walled by Jellicent, but again, that's what T-Tar is for, and Jellicent's going to have its hands full trying to stave off Keldeo, and thus you T-Tar it, and then Gliscor is happy. So T-Tar is pursuing for two on this team, but it's still generally fine, especially because Jellicent tends to run Culberberry, so if it comes in on Gliscor, then you taunt, you prevent it from healing off Stealth Rock with Recover, and then you go to Rotom and further dig Stealth Rock into the opposing team. Uh, this team really makes use of Stealth Rock being on the field with its double U-turn and uh, appreciating the extra chip and making it hard to deal with Gliscor over time. That's why Gliscor is so nasty. And of course, uh, something like Ferrothorn, you taunt, you SD, you beat that. So obviously you don't want to be roosting on super effective power whips if you can help it, but it's generally something easy to handle, especially because most Ferrothorn Maybe not most, but a good chunk of Ferrothorn are going to be eating a burn from Rotom. So I actually want to get to that next. The core of Rotom and Excadrill. So Rotom burning Ferrothorn means that Excadrill goes from a bad spinner against Ferrothorn to a great spinner against Ferrothorn because Ferrothorn is getting worn down and doesn't threaten with Power Whip nearly as much. So the burn really goes a long way in helping Excadrill keep the field clear of hazards while not getting rid of your own Stealth Rock. Uh, like Defog would. So, Rotom is Rotom. It helps you play around Mega Metagross, which is, of course, hugely important. And uh, it just facilitates the other offense because it Volt Switches out on things like Clefable, Excadrill comes in. Big threat. Ro Rotom Volt Switches on stuff and then brings in a threat. You bring in Clefable, you can go to Excadrill to just threaten it. You can go to Torn to threaten a knockoff on it. And if you don't think the Cliff Fable is going to want to take the knockoff and they're going to switch to Gliscor, you can U turn. Uh oh, Keldeo's now in. So Rotom gets in really easily and is able to facilitate great situations for its offensively minded teammates. And even though, you know, Tornadus and Gliscor are not what you would consider truly offensive Pokemon, and the Extra Drill doesn't have Swords Dance or anywhere close to max attack EVs, even though they are more. EV'd and thrown on the team with utility in mind, they can still be used aggressively. And that's why I like this team. It's great because it can benefit from being very aggressive, but it can also, it also has bulk. It's got longevity. So it's not like if Stalt can withstand the first assault, then they're out of the clear. They're getting chipped away at over time because even if Rotom gets statused, it abuses losing HP from burn or poison to get bigger pain splits off on its targets. So, you know, if the opponent has something like an Amoongus, burn it, you know, and then Torn and then Keldeo, you can stop its spore with Gliscor, and it's getting worn down over time, and Keldeo is eventually going to be really threatening. So Rotom just facilitates everything. Uh, here are some special attack EVs. I am not quite sure on them because CBB didn't mention them. But I, I do know that Rotom often runs special attack EVs to break Suicune Substitute at plus one for the uh, sub-protect sets. I think it's a little more, but I think that this is probably going to be something that's, you know, something in your, in your favor. And I know that CBB, I'm looking at the notes now, that he doesn't want to take... Uh, he doesn't want to take even more bulk out of Rotom because it already is threatened by Zen Headbutt Metagross, or just Metagross as a whole. Even Thunder Punch can take its toll. So, CBB does love Modest Rotom, and I think that is a great set too with how much it pressures Clefable and Gliscor, but uh, you can't afford it on this team, but it's still fine. The extra special attack actually helps uh, again, dealing with other Gliscor as well, because Gliscor can be a pain, but uh, Taunt and SD on this Gliscor, I should mention that it prevents other Gliscor from swords dancing up and it lets you beat them as long as you're faster. Now the speed creep boars, yeah, Ice Fang Gliscor is going to be a pain, 
but Ice Fang Gliscor also is not going to deal with Rotom. So it's a matter of figuring out what the set is and uh, going accordingly. So it would be nice to be able to fit Ice Punch on T-Tar, but Crunch and Pursuit are mandatory, especially Crunch because Slowbro is a pain. And Superpowers is the best coverage move, so you're hitting things like um, Heatran and Ferrothorn, and who Pokemon that you are able to threaten out with your massive attack stat. So, anyway, that's Rotom for you. Fairly standard fare. And it supports Extra Drill, like we just said. It burns the... It burns Ferrothorn, and then Extra Drill really enjoys that. Now, Extra Drill... It, with the Rotom Extra Drill core is further augmented by the amazing Tornadus. Now, as soft as Tornadus goes crazy in a lot of games, even with Stealth Rock up, even when it starts at 75% HP. So if you're able to keep Stealth Rock off, that is huge. That makes it even more unkillable. Because it's not, it's not just a slow regenerator poke, it's a fast regenerator poke with U-turn. So it's absolutely nightmarish to deal with. And if you can do that while keeping your own rocks up, i.e. spinning as opposed to defogging, then Tornadus with rocks up on your opponent's side and none of your own, that is a nasty situation to be in because you know even the Pokemon on the opposing team that don't care about rocks, Clefable gets knocked off, Gliscor is a U-turn out in a Keldeo. So I want to mention uh, Extra Drill once more because it is a great switch to most forms of Clefable and threatens it out and uh, spins on it. That's why Extra Drill is so good. It, thre it comes in on several dangerous Pokemon and it not only threatens them, like Heatran is another example, and you threaten them out, and you spin to boot. So, uh, the it, it now on this team, Extra Drill is more of a utility poke than a Sandra Sweeper, and I think this is a great call because Sandra's Drill tends to falter because you want to get this. You have limited turns of sand, and you want to get the Swords Dance, and you have to figure out if your opponent is. Uh, going to switch or not, or you know, how they're going to dance around it, waiting for sand to run out, and it can get really ugly and can be really frustrating. Sandrush Extra Drill on paper destroys everything after a Swords Dance, but re in reality, it gets played around way too easily, way too often. So, I agree with the idea to make it into more of a utility poke, and th this way you don't give up coverage. Which is really nice because the Charizards are annoying. Mainly, obviously, Mega Charizard X dies to EQ, but Charizard Y is a massive pain. And Talonflame is manageable, more or less, but the, you definitely prefer being able to threaten it with Rock Slide as opposed to uh, most of the time, Extra Drill runs EQ, Iron Head, Spin, and then like a filler, like Toxic or Stealth Rock. And those are good, but on this team, it's really, really nice to not let it come in and burn your Rotom and wear it down. And Rock Slide is also huge for Volcarona, so because Volk does not die to EQ, and Volk is actually one of the biggest threats. I mean, it can even muscle through a bulked out T-Tar, and Torn Therian actually sometimes runs Smackdown, just because un, uh, weakened Hurricanes, or, you know, un un ev Hurricanes are not going to break through boosted Volks, so uh, Smackdown is actually what you use to get the physical rock move on it. It's better than HP rock, and it also hits Charizard Y. This team doesn't really like it because it really likes Heat Wave, but it's something Torn runs in general. So uh, Excadrill is... Uh, CBB, again, his notes are that Excadrill is fear support because Keldeo and Gliscor are the win conditions. I dislike that term, but that's what he said. Uh, or, and I see what he means. That they're, yeah. Wow, let's try again. Those are the Pokemon that you use to really threaten the opponent. So, Extra Drill is more, has more important stuff to do than just try and fail to sweep on its own. Spinning is, of course, crucial, but it has to check uh, Clefable. Oh, another big th uh, thing that Rock Slide checks is Thunderous. Uh, with the special defense EVs being specifically to survive Focus Blast from full. And uh, sliving, Rock Sliding Volcarona is really good. So uh, Charizard Y actually does switch into Sandrush Extra Drill because on paper it is the perfect Sandrush Extra Drill answer. It doesn't mind either Stab and Drought removes Sandrush, Sandstorm and thus Sandrush. 
and you obviously threaten it out, and this team does not comfortably switch into Charizard Y because nothing really comfortably switches into Charizard Y. So uh, being able to rock slide Zard Y on the switch like that is wonderful. Uh, being able to check Thunderous is really valuable because Thunderous also resists Excadrill stabs. So uh, yeah, Toxic is nice on some teams because it cripples Rotom and Slowbro, and but here it's not as necessary as because the goal those Pokemon are getting handled by uh, your own Rotom, Tornadus Knock, Titar Sand, and Gliscor beating them down, Keldeo beating them down. So it's not really as required as uh, Rock Slide, which does a lot of things that no other move could do and couldn't really be replaced elsewhere on the team. I mean, I guess you could, in theory, start running HP Rock or SmackDown Tornadus, but taking Heat Wave off seems uh, rough. Bisharp is already kind of annoying, so you really want Heat Wave on Torn to minimize that, as well as threatening Mega Metagross. You want another faster Pokemon than Mega Metagross because you're not always going to be able to sand rush it with Excadrill and Rotom gets worn down, so Heat Wave feels fairly irreplaceable. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's Excadrill. And obviously against frailer teams it can threaten to sweep, but most of the time it's just a Swiss Army Knife, which is funny because of its appearance. But yeah, Drill is really good, and of course, enables the amazing Assault Vest Torn. So what's interesting about this team is that not only does it showcase the currently popular, currently really good core of Rotom, Excadrill, Torn, it also uh, showcases a rather new development in Oris in that it does not pack a dedicated Keldeo counter, which frees up a lot, of, a lot in team building. So Keldeo is famously uncounterable, and even its counters are exploitable. Uh, so people have been looking for ways, instead of being pigeonholed into using those counters and having you know, repetitive teams, you know, sometimes you're gonna have to bring a counter to it. But if you can have a couple soft checks to it, that really helps. So we find those here in the form of Assault Vest Torn, who's often not dealing with uh, Stealth Rock. So that helps, and then Rotom backs it up as well. Now, Rotom is not really a great Keldeo check over time, but this team is supposed to be offensive, so you gotta you gotta make do with what you have without giving up your own offense. Because on offense, yes, a lot of teams will just temporarily check it with Latios, but if you can have your offense generated instead and sort of out offense Keldeo while falling back on these two when needed, that gets the job done. So Rotom's Volt Switch in conjunction with Torn's U-Turn are, you know, a ton of offense when you're bringing in monsters like Gliscor and Keldeo, which pressure the opponent immensely over time. And eventually you are going to get in a situation, if you're playing a good player, where they get their Keldeo in on your Titar or your Gliscor or your Excadrill out of sand or even in sand, it's not gonna come anywhere close to KOing from full health. So you are gonna have to switch into it, but it's not like you're giving up a KO because Rotom can take a couple hits. You're gonna wanna be careful with it if you need Rotom for something like Mega Metagross, but that's why you have Torn. Torn will threaten it out and gain momentum back for you, which is why Torn is so insane and why keeping rocks off is so nice for it. So. That, uh, that new method of dealing with Kel hasn't really been thoroughly explored until now, and a lot of great Oris players are having great results with it, and it's allowing for a lot of diversity in team building without... Now, you can make diverse teams easily, but you gotta make them effective while remaining diverse. You know, so diversity is a means to an end. It's not, you know, I could make the most diverse team Oris has ever seen right now, but that wouldn't necessarily make it any good. It's an important distinction. So, finally, Keldeo. What, what is a CVB team without Keldeo? <laughs> what is Oris without Keldeo, really? It's the same monster it's always been. You know, it's Scald's early game, it's tough to wall, it's got the pursuit for its counters, it comes in easily because it's fast and strong and surprisingly bulky. It's as bulky as a max HP Starmie. And, you know, it comes in easily with Volt Switch and U-Turn support. And it's just a monstrous Pokemon to deal with. You know, T-Tar pursues his few checks, and 
whatnot. So the interesting thing that stands out here is Aquajet. Now Aquajet has actually been toyed with in black and white for Alakazam's sash, but we don't have anything like that here. So I'm gonna defer to TVB. So he says Kelio's last move is up for debate, and Aquajet looks funky, and he's never actually faced the high th situation which he has for it. So. The situation is uh, Bisha Bisharp coming in on Tornadus, living the Swords Dance, living the Heat Wave and getting up a Swords Dance, and then uh, having Aqua Jet to finish the Keldeo off, to finish the Bisharp off, and not have Keldeo take a huge chunk. And this is for those hyper offense teams uh, t because they aim at wearing Keldeo down so that. Uh, you, they are able to finish it off with uh, me Offensive Mega Scizor because uh, Offensive Mega Scizor does destroy everything else. You Now, if Tornadus is at full health and rocks are kept off by Drill, then yeah, Tornadus can live a plus 2 BP and Heat Wave, but you're going to need some insurance, and generally the idea is to uh, prevent it from coming to that in the first place by having the extra insurance with Aqua Jet Keldeo and like... Finishing off a 1% Belly Drum Azumarill if you're uh, if you're afraid of that and uh, don't want Rotom Chipped or getting outsped by Jolly. So it's a nice idea, especially because the last move on Keldeo really often... I mean, yeah, it can go a long way. And the first thing I would consider is HP Grass on this team, just to further pressure uh, Rotom more immediately and Slowbro and Jellicent. I think that's important. And uh, hurting Gastrodon certainly won't hurt either. But I could definitely see why Aqua Jet is here. So, uh, HP Grass and Toxie and all the other stuff felt like luxuries instead of actually improving matchups, CBB says. So he just stuck with Aqua Jet despite never using it. You know, it's He does think it's objectively the best because you don't really need any of the other moves. They're just nice to have. So, I understand it. I think that you could maybe toy around like in that situation where uh, Bisharp is heat-waving the Torn. Uh, the where Tornadus is heat waving the Bisharp because Gliscor tends to be pretty not good against those teams, so I think you could just use Gliscor against them, especially because Bisharp is forced to sucker punch. I don't know. You could tweak the EVs on it, uh, and to always live that plus two sucker punch. I think it's only like four defense with two forty eight HP, so you could drop a little bit of speed, something like that. So I think if you use Gliscor to finish off that uh, weakened Bisharp with Facade, then that would probably be enough. But, you know, it's, uh, Aqua Jet still has some nice applications, like if you're facing that 10% uh, Mega Alakazam, you're going to be really thankful for it, you know, especially in those situations, because whenever a team relies on Sandrush Excadrill to do its revenge killing, you're going to look for as many ways to fill in the gaps in those situations where you can't use Sandrush Excadrill as possible, so... I understand it. Personally, I think HP Grass is good here, but I, I totally understand why Aqua Jet... Extra insurance against Volcarona, in fact. Can never have too much of that. So, uh, yes. So now some words from CBB. Some more words, rather. Um, on the uh, creation of the team. So he built it because he was facing Ben Gay in World Cup, and he wanted to be good against cheesy teams. Specifically... Hyper Offense and Stall. Stall is generally considered fairly cheesy in Auris because it's of its amount of bad matchups. And Hyper Offense, I think, is less cheesy. Like, uh, stuff like Tank Chomp and then Belly Drum Azumarill and Bisharp and a bunch of other offensive pokes. That's less cheesy. That's just a strong offense team. But cheese in the in uh, terms of, like, the weird strategies Ben Gay is known for, like Sticky Web and whatnot. So, uh, or Altaria Megas or Altario Magnazone. So it's more comfortable against these kinds of teams than your standard Keldeo, Latios, Clefable kind of team. So, uh, yes, that, is, that was the reason why he get, built it. And you can see all the little moveset choices. The, uh, you know, Rotom is famously good against Cheese. Extra Drill gets rid of webs really nicely because of Sandrush. And, you know, you're not spin blocking it with Hoopa, which a lot of people use on webs. Also because of a CBB team, actually, but... That's a different story, and uh, yeah, so this team is very resilient against those kinds of offenses, and of course, Stall. Uh, I would not want to face this team with Stall, because Rotom on its own is irritating to Stall, Excadrill gets rid of hazards without 
uh, giving up its own. Tornadus is a regenerating, knocking U-turn machine. Keldeo with rocks up is massive danger. Titar gets those rocks up really, really nicely and is pressure of its own with Crunch and Pursuit. And Gliscor, God, the Gliscor on top of it all. So this team absolutely murders Stall. And we're going to actually see some replays of that. And uh, the Hyper Offense matchup as well. But it's not just a team that is looking for matchups because this team is good against you know the metagame as a whole. It's not just, uh, well, I hope he brings this and otherwise I lose kind of team, which I value. So obviously the matchups against those extreme styles of team is its most preferred. But even against opposing bulky offense, then you are able to just play the game. You know, they're not going to be able to withstand Keldeo over time, and you've got your Rotom and Tornadus to pressure them over time, and you're going to be just fine. I mean, you have to be careful around Mega Metagross because what team doesn't? But as long as you're smart, that's the one of the beauties of this team. It has no real automatic loss matchups. So, uh, this has been me talking again, by the way, but CBB also did say the team, in his experience, has no real auto-loss matchups. I mean, most good teams should not have one, but there's always that crazy stall or Volcarona or whatever. But this team doesn't really have those issues. So, uh, yeah. I mean, sure, this team is threatened by certain offensive pokes like um, Metacham, uh, Zard Y, and uh, Diancie can be pretty irritating as well, especially the HP Ice sets and the fact that Gliscor can't Earthquake it. But for the most part, those are reasonable prices to pay because you're not automatically losing to them. You're just going to have to outplay them, which is absolutely doable as long as you never ease up on the gas. And the, and the benefit is that you don't lose to the cheesy, dangerous, potentially losing at preview styles that have come to become common, that have become common in Oris as of late, and you know, a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to lose on matchup to this, and this team manages to throttle them while still just being a good team overall. You're not going to really be risking matchup with this team, which I think is valuable, and that's a mark of a good team in Oris, a good consistent team, rather, that you don't need to be praying to not face something. I mean, yeah, of course, you're going to like it when you don't see a Charizard Y, but it's I, you would prefer to play around a Charizard Y than be haplessly run over by a webs team or mercilessly outstalled with very little to do in return. So even though it is a bulkier team, a more balanced team, then it still benefits from being played aggressively. You're going to have to outplay offensive threats, and you definitely have the tools to do so. And another reason for Aqua Jet Keldeo, Diancie. So I guess I'm warming up to it. But yeah, you're going to... If you play aggressively, you don't throw away HP on your Pokemon needlessly. If you keep in mind the value of everything and play accordingly, you will be just fine. So, I mentioned, uh, are there any more words from CBB I want to go back to? Because that was just me talking now. Uh, oh, yes, he says, as far as hazards go, I found this team to be much, much more comfortable playing hazards, no hazards versus no hazards than rocks versus rocks. So... Uh, which is understandable because Rotom and Torn, especially Torn, but uh, gain a ton of survivability in, uh, without rocks. And you know, even Rotom, you don't, you don't really think of Rotom as a Pokemon worn down by rocks because it's hit neutrally and there's no permanent sand. But um, Rotom's survivability without rocks just shoots up when it's just barely staving off things like Mega Gross and you know, acting as a backup check to Keldeo. So uh, there's that. And... Uh, so, if you have to choose between trading rocks or keeping both hazards off, then both hazards off is generally the right way to go. And you don't really need hazards to grab your KOs. Uh, I mean, sure, they definitely help, especially in not in uh, making Gliscor dangerous over time. And especially because Gliscor, Kelio, and Titar are so nasty together. But you are going to be relying on Tornadus and Rotom being healthy in a lot of matchups, so that is where your priorities lie. Of course, if you can get up rocks, because Mega Titar's a beast, and you can get that spin-off with Escadrill, you are golden. That is ideal. But if you have to pick rocks versus rocks, or has no hazard versus no hazards, then uh, the latter is preferable. So, 
Uh, yes. Oh, Life Orb Clefable is fairly irritating. But, uh, so you could run Super or Stone Edge on T-Tar. That would help a lot. I'm just looking for all their uh, uh, alter yeah, moveset alternatives. So, uh, Altaria is actually kind of a pain. You gotta get up Sand and Revenge with Extra Drill. Just don't let it in for free. Chip it. And, you know, it's dangerous, but doable. But Altaria is kind of niche. I mean, it's been seeing some usage again lately, but it's not the most dangerous thing in the universe. It is still held back by its flaws. And if you get, if you play aggressively, rocks, sand, constantly having momentum with the bolt turn combination and offensive pressure, you should be all right. So uh, you could definitely make the Gliss score bulkier. I personally, this is me talking, Kev, you love max special defense Gliss score. It does the most ridiculous things. And I understand why it's speed, and CBB does too. He says both faster and slower are understandable. Uh, outspeeding other Gliss score is nice, so, but you can't go too much speed because it's not like an offensive Ice Fang Gliss score or a more offensive Ice Fang Gliss score. You need all the bulk on this team. You got to be staving off the Torns and living the ridiculous stuff like HP Ice from Diancy and Ice Beam from Clefable. So, uh, by that rationale, I personally would just go more bulk with this set, but I, either way, this this spread is fine, and whatever you wind up on, as long as you don't take too much bulk out of it, is probably going to be good, and uh, Keldeo is really nice against those fat teams, where it's Gliscor on Gliscor Wars anyway, and as long as you're smart with your Rotom, and your Torn, and your Keldeo, then you should be fine, so, alright, that's everything, so, uh, now we will switch the music and switch over to the tournament replays. So the first one, you've probably seen this on Blunder's channel. Let me adjust the dimensions. So this was from World Cup 2019 semi-finals. And uh, this was where the, you know, we mentioned where this team was born, where CBB wanted a good matchup against the cheesy stuff, and he wound up facing Webb. So... Let's he see how it does. So, uh, leading off with Keldeo against Shuckle because, look, this team does not switch into Keldeo. He's got to keep it healthy for the Scizor Bisharp combo. Remember, that's the Aqua Jet. But it's still going. It's early in the game. He's just going to remove Shuckle, the automatic lead, and make it easier for Excadrill to spin later so it doesn't get Encored or anything dumb. So, Shuckle at 1 HP is a lot easier to keep hazards off against than. Shuckle at high HP because then Extra Drill could spin and it'd be faster. So Shuckle just goes for another Sticky Web and switches to Gengar as uh, Extra Drill is encored. So then the webs are up and you're kind of annoyed. Not necessarily against the Gengar because you have a faster AV Torn, which is amazing, but it, more because it's going to be a problem with dealing and when dealing with Scizor later. So uh, the Scald goes up. Shuckle goes down to one. Gengar is not a good spin blocker against Rush Drill, and uh, even that, because even at uh, with Sticky Web up, it's still going to have plus one speed, so it's going to blow right by it and threaten everything pretty much. So uh, the red card, I don't, I'm not pretty sure that's not a standard on Shuckle. I mean, it, it is one of the standards on Shuckle, but I know a lot of them also run Mental Herb and um, and something else, but. Red card is the... Uh, I'm going to take that back. The CBB webs, which is also very popular, then I believe that one runs red card uh, shuckle more often than not. Maybe I'll feature that team just because... or as part of a webs and auras kind of thing. Interesting. I love when I get video ideas while making a video. So in comes the Megatar. It's going to get the rocks up. Or, no, sorry. It just goes right for the crunch. It got in uh, without minus one speed, so... God, that does a ton of damage. I guess he's... That was a smart move in saving the Mega, because... Hmm. No, maybe maybe not. Because I was thinking it, he needed to reset the uh, Sandstorm. But if Sandstorm is already up, T-Tar Mega Evolving does not reset it up. So, like, uh, for example, if it was Zard, uh, regular Zard versus regular T-Tar, and Sand is up and Megazard Y evolves and Drought goes up, and then Mega T-Tar Mega evolves, and then Sand comes back up. But we don't have a situation like that, so. Uh, I'm not sure why he preserved the 
the Mega in that situation, uh, he can give input if he likes. Uh, maybe just to surprise him and make him think that he doesn't have a Mega, which, you know, fair. I think the extra damage... Maybe he just expected him to stay in. That might have been it, because... Uh, he didn't expect him to go to the Scizor right away because Scizor is such a threat with Sticky Web down that he would want to preserve it so it can take a hit from uh, from Excadrill. And so that was surprising, but I guess he wanted to preserve the Shuckle if he could. So now he switches to Torn, Scizor Megas, Swords Dance up, and it's at full health so it can take the plus two bullet punch with health to spare, even with two rounds of sand, and it heat waves it back. So another reason for heat wave on Torn. So not just Bisharp, not just finishing off Mega Metagross, and you know pressuring Ferrothorn is always nice, but also Mega Scizor, so definitely the right call. It'd be nice to have like Smackdown or, or HP Ice even because other Gliscor is annoying. Those would be great, but he'd be giving up super something super important, and I think Heatwave is just the best compromise overall. So Thunderous Therian comes in, and U-Turn, in comes Tyranitar, and... You know, this is going to be annoying, but here's... No, oh, that was great. That was really great. I see the foresight now. So now T-Tar can come back in as Sand ends and get the Sand back up with the Mega. That was really smart. Okay, I, I understand now. Uh, I'm glad that was revealed for me. It's like the beginning of the movie where you're like, oh, I don't get it. And then later you're like, oh, okay, so... I'm glad. That was really, really nicely done. There was really very little benefit to going Mega right away, and there was potentially a lot of benefit for Mega-ing later on, so that was the absolutely the right move. So now, even if Thunderous goes for a Focus Blast, then Extra Drill will come in, it'll have maximum turns of sand that it could, and... Uh, then it will rock slide the Thund, and it'll probably get rid of webs, and then from there, Keldeo and Torn will probably win the game. So, uh, that's if Thunders has Focus Blast, because he goes for another Nasty Plot. I don't know what moves he could be running if he's not running Focus Blast, three attacks. I mean, I don't know, T-Bolt, HP Ice, Focus Blast, and uh, Agility, because you're running Agility to blow by... Um, what's it called? Latios because it doesn't get hit by webs? I don't know, I think. That was weird, so... I mean, uh, maybe someone else can elucidate what it might run. Like, if he was running Substitute to really make use of Sticky Web and getting up a sub as something was sacked and then really being tough to deal with, I guess, but I think the coverage on Thunders is too crucial. You can't give up coverage against Ferrothorn and Excadrill and Heatran, so... I don't know what was that, that, that was about, but t just smacks it with a crunch, and good night. I mean, not anything super effective, just a neutral crunch. Megatar is strong, so here comes Manaphy. And it is, you know, there's not a lot of switch-ins to this because it outspeeds Keldeo with uh, this, and you don't want to go to extra drill necessarily, and with Sand turns limited. And you can chip, you can finish it off with Torn, but you gotta chip it first, so that's what the crunch is for. And a plus three Surf does not come close to KOing Megatar. Good lord. So now it is, uh, so he makes a great move here, uh, the right move. Gliscor is worthless against these hyper offense teams. See, another reason why I think you could use Gliscor to finish off Bisharp against those hyper offense teams and preserve Keldeo. Uh, not needing Aqua Jet necessarily, because Gliscor is otherwise worthless against them. So he sacks uh, Gliscor so he can get the rock, so he can get the sand back up and Manaphy dies to sand. So here comes Bisharp, here comes Excadrill, minus one speed. So Gengar comes in on Earthquake, fine, but if uh, you know, it's still a rough scenario because he goes to, it's still, he can't break through this team with Bisharp and Gengar against Keldeo and Assault Vest Torn. And, you know, T-Tar gets the sand right back up. Bisharp can't dance on it. And I guess if you were to run Stone Edge on T-Tar, then you would not be able to do this. But it would still be nasty. So this team's uh, anti-cheese property is really shown here. And the second big game was... Let's see, that game was July 3rd, 2019. This game was July 11th, 2019. And it was for the same series... So that first game was for the World Cup semifinals, and this is for the World Cup semifinals tiebreaker. So uh, West selected Zamog, and CBB brought, what's that? The exact same team. Oh, he changed the order of the Pokemon. 
And uh, when I asked him for the import, the one we see on screen here is what he said is the definitive one, but he used two different versions against uh, Ben and Zamog. So uh, you can see that in how he changed the order, just so Zamog might not instantly think, oh, it's the same team. But uh, yeah, the the general idea is the same, he says. So uh, this time he's not facing a cheese team. He's not facing super stall or super offense or hyper offense, uh, rather. So he's just running, facing a bulky offense team. So here we're going to see how the team plays in those non-specialized matchups in the general kind of metagame. So another interesting thing about Zom's team is that he's also using the Rotom Torn Core, the play around Keldeo rather than counter it thing. And he's also got Mega Metagross, which loves, which doesn't switch into Keld, but loves outspeeding it and turning it into offensive momentum. So. Uh, we're going to see how it works in this offense-on-offense offense matchup, or bulky offense-on-bulky offense, bulky offense matchup. So, uh, Rotom, as always, is amazing because look what switches into Will-O-Wisp, approximately Zilch. If Ferrothorn gets burned, Excadrill loves it. So, uh, Zamog, I don't think he makes the right moves because he sacks Lando just to get rocks off, and now he goes to Pharaoh and it's going to get burned, and Excadrill is going to permanently remove the rain and yeah okay so he is wearing down Rotom uh, which is nice and that's going to be huge for Mega Metagross later so it's not like this was completely without merit but I think he could have done that without sacking his Lando and permanently losing rocks but yeah Excadrill is now going to Volt Switch for completely free and uh, wear down Ferrothorn a little more in the process for easier Scald spamming later on and there's nothing Zama can do about it he doesn't have a ground type to block volt switch with so extra drill is going to come in here and spin and there is nothing that can be done about it so goodbye hazards permanently leaf seed you know, miss sucks but it's going to spin it away so uh, this is the power of rotom drill and why a lot of people like it so much and thus from the power of rotom drill then tornadus becomes even stronger so uh, now you try to get those rocks up and here comes torn therian so goes for a superpower, which is unexpected, and Mega Titar lives, even though it's a Life Orb Torn. So I guess I take back what I said about him using the Torn Rotom Core to uh, to soft check Keld, because this Tornadus is not a Keldeo switch, and because it doesn't have a Salt Vest, but it's a similar idea because Tornadus offensively threatens Keldeo, and with Life Orb is very difficult to switch into, so it's more about giving it less switch-ins and having a lot of offense in return. So Mega Metagross also represents that idea. So uh, yes, slightly different from CBB's method and the more widespread method that's being used right now. But Life Orb Torn, I mean, for all its fault, it is tough to switch into. And CBB's rocks are staying. Zomog has no rocks removal. And maybe getting rid of Torn would have been nice, but the rocks are going to be nice to wear down the Rotom for Gliscor and Extradrill and Tornadus and Keldeo. So never underestimate rocks and hell even metagross needs several rock rounds of rocks to die from even max attack extra drills earthquake so that can be really big and you always like chipping away at keldeo so this is ideal scenario in, a, in the sense that it has no uh, it's rocks for cbb and no rocks for zombog so he's gonna really really feel he's gonna be able to abuse tornadoes to the fullest so uh now, Life Orb Torn often does not run Nox, so he feels pretty good about switching to Gliscor on it. And he goes for the Hurricane Misses, which bites, but... Uh, now he just goes for a Facade, and with minus one, then... So those Hurricane Misses do suck. And we'll see how it ends up impacting the game. So, uh, Special Defense Gliscor is really nasty for beating it. For, um... For sw eating up Torn most of the time. With Life Orb, I think it still can take it. Uh, fairly well, but obviously it's not as automatic as against Assault Vest Horn. So, and uh, Facade, look, even without Earthquake, it's going to be threatening this team. I mean, obviously it doesn't enjoy the fact that Metagross can come into it once the jig is up, but the thing is the jig is never going to be up against this team because he doesn't require Taunt against anything else, so he never has to reveal his lack of Earthquake. So that's why this Gliss score, even if the lack of Earthquake was revealed, it would still be really irritating to deal with because he would uh, slowly wear down Metagross over time. Now obviously he uh, his Rotom is out of commission against Metagross, it's good for little more than a sack against it, 
but it's still going to, but uh, I just totally lost my point trying to say a bunch of things. But the general idea is Metagross is going to get worn down with rocks and slowly getting chipped into range for Torn. And you, know, you got to be careful with Rotom. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but as long as he keeps up offensive pressure, then he will be able to dance around it. So he went to Excadrill, I think, expecting... I think he wanted to uh, absorb the last Hurricane and let it die to life orb without risking Gliscor getting confused or something, because there's nothing really else that... Uh, he switched, uh, maybe he was expecting a Metagross switch in, and Excadrill would be faster than Metagross in the turn Metagross Mega Evolves because of Aura's Mega Mechanics. So, uh, if Me he thought Metagross was pivoting into a facade to threaten it out, then he would catch Excadrill there. He would catch it there, or catch a, you know, the final Hurricane, so that seemed pretty reasonable, but I guess he didn't expect Rotom to come into a directly into a facade, so... And now he's got to switch back to Gliscor, no harm, no foul, because Gliscor is dumb. And he's like, yeah, I know Hydro Pump's coming. Why do you ask? Because even with non-max bulk, then it just switches in and yikes. Now, it does give Keldeo a free switch. And this is uh, on Zamog's end. We also see why the Rotom Keldeo core is nice. Because even if Gliscor does this, then, you know, uh-oh, something way stronger is in and going to threaten. Of course... Uh, CBB does have a... Oh, he uses Keldeo to switch in. So that was a really smart move because he needs his Torn a lot more than he needs his uh, Keldeo. And Keldeo can take a couple water moves and blast Zamog's Keldeo in return and nothing switching into it. He's, he would pretty much uh, ruin Keldeo and then be able to dance around it and still have his Keldeo to pick up another KO later uh, when you know, Torn can't switch in, Rotom, die, or Rotom can't take two with rocks up, or comes very, very close to dying, Pharaoh dies, so, and Metagross doesn't want to switch in, so, I think his plan here was just take two spec scalds and uh, blast it in return, and then sack something, and probably erode him, and go from there with uh, Torn pressure, so, but it turns out it's a Scarf Keldeo, so Zom had uh, anti-Vulk insurance, and his own anti keld insurance in a way, so, uh, Scald's not doing too much, and Keldeo is super favored here. He has no choice but to just stay in and go for a burn, which he does get on the second attempt. And the Specs or sword, Spec Secret Sword uh, does a ton. So now double Keldeo down, which could be a lot worse. The major threat on Zamog's end is the Metagross, and Keldeo does not do anything to quell the Metagross threat other than threatening a lot of damage on the turn it Mega Evolves, which is hard to facilitate. So... Guaranteeing Keldeo goes down is really nice. And if the Metagross does not have Ice Punch, then Gliscor can sit on it, chip it into range. Now he goes to Extra Drill. Great move. So Metagross does not get a free Mega off against Torn or Rotom or Gliscor or Titar. So he's delaying the Metagross threat and he gets extra Stealth Rock chip on it. Really nicely done. Uh, so this will put it into range of Torn Heat Wave or Extra Drill EQ more easily later. And then he goes to his own Rotom uh, in case... Uh, the extra drill, I'm not sure, well, because uh, if you, I guess he's scouting the moveset, he can see if it's Earthquake, or, yeah, by going there, if, he doesn't risk extra drill dying, he doesn't risk giving Rotom a completely free switch, although I'm not sure if that really matters if he's just going to go to Gliscor every time, and if Metagross did stay in, then he would be able to scout its moveset, he's going to see if it's Earthquake or Hammer Arm, he's going to, and then he can, like, pivot to... I guess if it's hammer arm, then he dies, but, uh, yeah, and Tor and T-Tar will not speed at minus one, so I think what he was expecting was just, oh, he might have been expecting Torn to come in, and he didn't want to risk, yeah, that's an interesting idea, he can't risk iron heading the Exca, or the Metagross, and, he, but he doesn't want Torn coming in for free, necessarily, I'm not sure, because both Rotom and Torn are... That's interesting, because either way, I feel like he just switches to Gliscor against both. And so I guess he was trying to heal up... Well, And even Rotom, I think, dies to superpower from this range. So it's an interesting idea. Uh, let's hit up the Calc, because I love the Calc. So Tornadus with... Let me copy-paste my R like I always do. Tornadus T, Life Orb, Rotom, let's just say Physically Defensive Pivot. So yeah, uh, Superpower for even Max Defense is 
I don't know if he's running that much, but it's still a... Let's say it had a very good chance to KO, so... I'm not 100% on the Rotom switch there. I think just EQing was probably fine, because... I think his move is... Oh, unless he... Okay, he di if he lives the Volt Switch, then that was a great move. I should have calc that. But he just gets crit instead. Yeah, okay, Volt Switch tops out at 29. So that, that really sucks. Okay, so it was a great move overall. He was trying to heal up his Rotom on Zamog's Rotom. And uh, if... Yeah, so that was a great move, and it didn't pan out. So I was under the assumption that uh, the Volt Switch would KO, but that was foolish of me, so... The crit makes it harder for him, so that was a great move on CBB's end. So, this is another example of the team's strengths. You gotta be really, really aggressive with it. Even though it's a, you know, a bulky team, it's not a team that's so bulky you want to just be switching around all day. You gotta make the most of your pieces, and, you know, with Rotom Weekend, that was a great move to try and get it back up to full health and uh, grab a key volt switch on something, you know, chip, you know, Pharaoh being out of the way is nice because that's one less thing Zama can sack later, and you know, maybe healing it a little bit would be worthwhile. So th uh, that was a good move and didn't pan out because of the crit. So uh, I take back what I was saying earlier. So here comes Torntherian looking to win the speed tie and finish it off, and he does not get that. Well, it's more than just the speed tie because he has to uh, speed tie and hit Hurricane, so very much not in his favor. So I think that's, uh, if I'm doing my math right, he had a 65% chance to come out on top on that turn because uh, 0.5 times 0.7. So it would be a 35% chance for Zomog to uh, come out on top there. But at least he doesn't crit or confuse because now at least uh, he has no choice but to go to Metagross. I guess he could go to Rotom, but Rotom just get, gives Gliscor another free switch, and Metagross actually is starting to force KOs now. So, uh, yeah, that means that since he has to go to Metagross, then CBB at least gets chip on it with U-Turn. So every little bit of chip counts when you're thinking of Heat Wave, because... Uh, let's go to the calc once again. Torn... Therian... This is a very ancient spread used to kill Keldeo from full health, which is kind of excessive. But yeah, so, guarantee kill Keldeo. Meta Gross, Mega versus Heatwave does, yeah, 41 to 53, let's say. So, uh, you are really scrapping for every percent here. And the thing is that you don't really have a great switch in because... And even the revenge killing attempt from Excadrill gets stuffed by Rotom, so you gotta keep Gliscor around. So he just sacks the... Sacks the T-Tar, which is a great move because this gives extra drill max sand, and you can rub sand into Rotom, and uh, so he makes a great move, doubles the Gliss score. So he, uh, so now that Rotom has come in to stave off the uh, extra drill, then plus even you get to learn more about its set. The most dangerous set here is anything with. Uh, Earthquake or Hammer Arm, and then Ice Punch. Ideally, Earthquake, because Hammer Arm at least can uh, provoke a speed drop, which can be taken advantage of with good switching. But you, if it has Ice Punch for Gliss Score, then you know, even if Metagross stays in and goes for Hammer Arm, then you learn if it's EQ or Hammer Arm. But the ideal scenario is you get Gliss Score in as Torn come, as uh, Rotom comes in, so you threaten it with Facade, and it's losing health because of Rocks and Sand, and now you just spam Facade. So... That's why Gliss score is a pain. I mean, that 26 doesn't look like a lot, but it kind of is. And now he's not going to be stalled out of Hydro Pumps anytime soon. Now the Roost, he's not even going to Roost. He's just going to keep keep uh, attacking. That's a great move because lower it gets, the worse it is against uh, Tornadus and Excadrill alike. So sacrificing his Gliss score to bring down the Rotom is fantastic. So now he goes to the Torn Therian. He goes for the Hurricane, knowing knockoff, I think, was not favored to kill a Rotom. We'll do the calc, but... Uh, oh, it's Hasty Torn. Yeah, so knockoff, not worth the risk, because it was at 16, and we see the calc is 14 to 17, so that would be really dumb, so uh, probably higher chance of just hitting Hurricane. So he goes for that, and here comes Metagross again. And, you know, still, it's still just barely out of heat wave range. And you can't let it kill either of your two pokes, because otherwise that's game. And uh, we'll take a look at Metagross versus 
Torn Therian, so uh, Ice Punch is the threat. Yeah, see, Ice Punch can... Oh, that's versus, like, zero bulk. So, you know, I guess in theory you're probably safe here anyway, unless he's Ice Punch. Or, I guess you're also fearing Bullet Punch at this point. Uh, so, you want to be safe. I mean, worst case, you have a full health Torn um, eating... A hit and a half, but the fact that Zamog reveals Pursuit makes it even tougher because now you can no longer eat that hit, and you can you can't eat the hit one on one to finish it off with two heat waves and then win the game. You have to uh, out predict the Metagross here because you can't just let it kill your extra drill. And obviously, if it uh, be, if it switches if it meteor mashes the Torn switch, then it's tough. So. It's, uh, what do you do? He goes back to Torn, eats Hammer Arm, so now with the speed drop, then uh, even if it gets Pursuited again, and last time it did 46, this time the Torn's at 49, so it should live, uh, ideally. So, I mean, we can check the calc by putting in Crunch, because that is the same power as, uh, so Crunch, yeah, it would never kill versus this, it's gonna do 48 max. So, that was the right move. Heat, so, you turning it into Heat Wave range once again. And uh, Thunder Punch, so interesting set. And now Excadrill chases it out because of uh, the speed drops as it gets T punched. And Heat Wave does 45 minimum versus zero bulk. Even four. Yeah, so in, it should die even if it didn't switch out. But now that it's switched out and taken more Stealth Rock damage then it is 100%, it's a 90% chance for CBB to win because of Heat Wave. So, uh, accuracy. Well, there's also Meteor, uh, no, Thunder Punch is 100%. So he hits the Heat Wave and that's the game. So, you know, two wins for this team, two incredibly important tournament wins for this team in the span of little, little more than a week, which is pretty amazing. So, uh, those are the big ones, of course. And now... We have uh, this team being used by some other players. We're not going to watch all these game, both these games in depth because uh, they're very long. But I just wanted to showcase how it dominates stall. So uh, yeah, see, Altaria is a threat, but uh, Excadrill threatens in return. So you know, Keldeo. So it's mainly the Gliscor going wild in this because look. There's Taunt and Facade, so Quagsire can't haze, and it's going to take a while to beat it down with Facade, but look, nothing, you can't wall this thing's Facades with Gliscor or Skarm, so uh, Quagsire's Scalds will get stalled out, and it's going to, you know, it needs to chain, like, I don't even know if chaining a million crits would work, because I guess you'd run out of roosts eventually, but even the crit only does 51, so you're still not out damaging Gliscor even with a crit, so yeah, so the Scar, the Gliscor basically just goes insane and you know, even if he does allow a boost, a haze rather, then he's just gonna keep beating it down, so yeah, good night. That's the Gliscor for you. And it's actually getting stalled out of Scalds, so uh, once it gets stalled out of Scalds, then it struggles and then it struggles once it's been taunted, so yeah, and you just, I mean, and this is just without rocks or anything, so imagine if uh, Jit had gotten his rocks up earlier, and then ABR really wouldn't have been able to switch around it. So this just shows how nasty Quag or Gliscor is against these kinds of stall teams, because look, no Scalds, and now it has to struggle, and, you know, Gliscor just solos. So that is the strength of this Gliscor, and then here's another replay where uh, Gliscor does amazing things. Uh, Torn, Chip, etc. Keldeo. Uh, you know, even not. Diancy is annoying and being able to. Not being able to Earthquake, it sucks, but you can still take that Moonblast. Or that. Uh, not the Moonblast. Not just the Moonblast, but also the HP Ice. And uh, Rotom is irritating forever, making sure the rocks don't go up. Gliscor roosts, eats a Moonblast, Chip with Facade again. And, you know, pivoting around it to get the most out of your things. And look, Rotom just snatches the momentum right back. That's what Rotom does. And here comes, you know, there's not really a solid Keldeo answer on this team. So, Kel uh, Stall team, like even ABR's team, this team does not enjoy Keldeo at all. It's basically, 
you know, with rocks up, Altaria is not a great switch, so this team just bullies Stahl from every direction. And, uh, yeah. So here's the Gliscor, gets ta taunt and bounced back, and so Keldeo, another threat, you know, especially if it's getting, if it's starting to burn. So look, it lives the HP ice from 85, <laughs> and just facades once again. So, uh, yeah, Exga, Spin, Rotom being annoying, even with Knock, even with Status, it just turns that to its advantage with Pain Split. So it's going to Pain Split on Chansey if it can, and now look, Roost, Drill, Gliscor again, Swords Dance, Swords Dance, Taunt, and the same Song and Dance, and now this is an unusual stall team on ZF's end, but look, even the Ice Beam getting tanked, getting stalled out, uh, you know, over the course of a game, Clefable's not going to be able to keep up, so Gliscor is just a menace and a half, and yeah, good switching around with Excadrill, and <laughs> you know, it just stays in on the ice move pokes and beats things down, so Gliscor does Gliscor things, CBB score as it's referred to, and Yeah, so, uh, there's not much else to say other than ball game. So, yeah, Gliscor is just insane. All right, so that's been the team. So thank you to CBB for uh, providing his insight and the import and notes and whatnot. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this was informative for you and uh, this that you enjoyed and everything. So if you want to use this team on the Oris Ladder or whatever Oris tournament you join, then uh, go nuts. You can just copy all the details from this video because they are all there. And uh, be aware that this team has already been very, very popular. Like I remember Solwyn was using it to win some Oris Live Smoke and Tours a couple seasons ago. Uh, so yeah, it is not an un, uh, it is not a completely new concept, you're not going to be catching anyone by surprise with it, but that you don't need to be surprising to be a good team, and this team is thoroughly excellent. So, uh, thank you guys for watching, I hope you enjoyed, I hope you took something from this, and I will catch you next time.